Welcome to The Hill's Coronavirus Report. I'm Steve Clemens, editor-at-large of The Hill. Each day, we are interviewing consequential leaders and innovators in the battle against the coronavirus. When the looting starts, the shooting starts. That is what President Trump tweeted yesterday, prompting Twitter to attach a tag to the tweet that says, the tweet breaks its rules for glorifying violence and disallowing others to like or forward that tweet. Minneapolis and other parts of the country are now erupting in anger over the alleged police abuse and possible murder of George Floyd, a black man whose air supply was cut off by a Minneapolis police officer since fired using an illegal hold. This tension is on top of what is already a stressful time from the devastation of COVID-19 on communities across America. 41 million are now officially unemployed. But last week, AFL-CIO President Richard Trumka told me that that number, with now 2.1 million more this week, is 55 million, historic for the United States, either if you choose the high number or the low number. America was divided before the coronavirus hit. Inequality was growing and acknowledged on both sides of the aisle. The desperation in the country manifested in racial bias and abuse and an opioid addiction and deaths was terrible before the virus tidal wave that hit just a few months ago. Someone who has been trying to address the economic divide nationally and trying to find ways that technology can play a constructive role in growing rural communities and connecting them to positive tracks forward, and someone who worked early with senators like Bernie Sanders to get massively larger national investments in PPE provision around the nation, is the congressman from California's 17th district who represents Santa Clara, one of the earliest hard-hit parts of the country from COVID. Joining me now to help us understand which way is north on the coronavirus and these tense times when leadership seems to be melting down and the need for answers from the legislative branch and the executive branch couldn't be greater. And at a time when leadership is needed now more than ever is Representative Ro Khanna. Congressman, thanks so much for joining me today. Let's just start with the fact that this nation was a mess before COVID hit. Uh, COVID has hit. And on top of that now, we have uh, protests in Minneapolis. We had um, yet another uh, case of alleged police abuse and, and, the, and the death of a man. And, and I just want to ask you, as we start this conversation, how do you as a congressman uh, find your way through this moment where you're dealing both with a national health crisis, but we're also somewhat dealing with a crisis over our own soul? Well, Steve, uh, it's a difficult time for all of us as citizens. Our country is deeply uh, divided. You have the president of the United States threatening violence against uh, American citizens. Uh, even Richard Nixon uh, was remorseful after Kent State. I mean, even he understood that the United States government shouldn't be shooting its own citizens. And now you have a president literally uh, going on social media uh, and threatening to shoot uh, protesters. Uh, and a president who has uh, called protesters fighting for racial justice thugs, but unwilling uh, to call those marching in Charlottesville, the racist thugs. Uh, so it is a time uh, of a lack of uh, moral leadership in our country. I mean, on the Minneapolis situation, uh, if you want to stop the, the protest, the way to do it is to arrest the officers. That's why they're protesting. Have an investigation into the police department. Uh, Karen Bass, uh, the chair of the CBC, called for that. Why they're not arresting those officers is beyond me. We're also in a time where we've been in a tug of war between those who have, I mean, this may be an unfair distinction, but between those who've been saying we need public health uh, first, public health guardrails that are very strictly adhered to versus those that want to have uh, a rapid reopening. I know there's a middle ground there, but I'd love to get your insights at this moment when we are seeing so much of the country reopen again, uh, seeing, you know, and we're seeing incidents like in Lake of the Ozarks where there's a kind of human jam going on. How do we, what are the equities? What's the equilibrium that we have to get right between those different impulses? Well, first, we should have listened to science. I mean, had we done what South Korea did, which is tell people to wear masks early on, uh, had we gotten private testing companies uh, involved in February, uh, had we sheltered in place back then, uh, like my district did in Santa Clara, March 16th, we sheltered in place, even though we were one of the first hits, we've only had 120 uh, uh, deaths. That's, that's obviously uh, uh, significant, but it's nowhere near 
or what some other regions have faced because we sheltered in place. I mean, so, I mean, let me just stop you there for a minute. Can you just profile it? Because when I was reading about Santa Clara and how hard it was hit at the beginning, can you just go through those numbers? Because at the beginning of March, you had about 400 some odd cases, which was a lot at that time. And tell us how things have unfolded. Well, the, the cases, we were the first county in the nation uh, to shelter in place. And as a result, uh, the, the deaths have been much fewer. The cases have been growing at one of the slowest rates in the entire country. In fact, the former CDC had said that if uh, New York had sheltered in place when we did, there would have been 80 percent, 80 percent fewer casualties uh, in New York. Now, this is not because of me or any of the uh, the elected officials, it was Sarah Cody, the health official, who had the insight after having talked to epidemiologists to, to do that. Uh, so we, uh, you know, that should be a lesson for the country about listening to science. Now, how are you reopening now? I've seen California Governor Gavin Newsom's uh, plans. Where does Santa Clara fit in that right now? How is your own reopening process going? Well, we're opening uh, cautiously. I mean, we are opening some of the uh, manufacturing businesses. We're opening uh, businesses uh, uh, that are essential. Uh, we are uh, not opening high contact businesses. Uh, and we're making sure that uh, people have PPE and they have social distancing. And I guess that to me seems to be uh, a way forward. Uh, open up, but do it with social distancing, do it with worker protection, uh, do it with providing PPE. Uh, and then monitor the results and be willing to uh, slow down or shut things down if the results spike. Otherwise, continue to open up in a responsible way. And that's, uh, I, I think, a way forward. I think, unfortunately, you've had uh, people try to politicize it, uh, where most Americans uh, understand the common sense of what we need to do. Now, you've been an advocate and you continue to push the buttons of we need free testing, we need ever-present testing, and we need free treatment for people. Um, where do those stand? Well, it's not just that we need testing and, and we're at, you know, we uh, should be at about uh, six, seven hundred thousand tests a day. We're still uh, away from that. But we need to know then what to do with the testing. I mean, we need people who then will engage in contact tracing like they've done in other countries and have uh, people uh, trained for that. Uh, Bernie Sanders and I called for uh, massive production on the Defense Production Act to build the things that would be that are the bottlenecks for the testing, because the, the challenge is we don't have some of the swabs and the equipment for the testing. Look, we're getting better, but we're still not uh, where we need to be. Uh, and then we want to be treating people. I mean, if uh, you shouldn't steer a bill uh, to go get treatment. That hurts all of them. You know, I talked to CDC Director Robert Redfield recently, and he said he was looking to hire about somewhere between 30 and 100,000 contact tracers. Do you think that's enough? I, well, I would defer uh, to him. I mean, I don't want to uh, second guess the CDC director, and, and, and he's pretty non political. If he's saying 30 to 100,000, then, then we should do that. Uh, you know, there was an MIT professor who had a, a great idea for a digital work process, progress administration, uh, sort of a New Deal idea, mm -hmm. but in terms of digital skills, that we have such needs for contact tracing or uh, health electronic records or other areas that the country could employ people in some of these digital tasks and get people back to work. I know, and there have been some companies, and I know you're in the tech community and you're a tech guy yourself. I interviewed recently Andrew Frame, the CEO of Citizen, who's created something called Safe, I think it's called Safe Trace, uh, in a way to kind of begin looking at how you can create what Taiwan has done uh, and look at how you instantly alert people uh, if they've come into contact with you know, someone who is diagnosed with COVID and whatnot. So there's a lot out there. But getting into the tech area, uh, Congressman, I know you've been, I mean, I think one of the interesting things about COVID is it has exacerbated problems and tensions we had in the country before. One of the areas you worked on was rural development and trying to get tech jobs and tech investment into rural areas. And I'd love to hear where that stands now and whether that continues to be, you know, an important priority for you as you look at a more inclusive economic development plan in the country at a time we've got 41 million officially unemployed. Well, Steve, I think it's accelerated the, the need for that. I mean, you first of all are seeing tech companies realize that remote work is more possible. Facebook has said they're going to go all remote, or at least half of their employees are going to be remote. Twitter has said the same thing. So I think you're seeing that uh, we're going to have more decentralization of technology jobs and opportunities. Uh, Majority Whip Fiber has an extraordinary bill 
uh, $80 billion to finally get the country hooked up to high-speed internet so every part of the country has that. Consider this. We're spending $3 billion on relief. Can't we spend $80 billion to hook up the internet uh, uh, for every American? And then let's look at the controversy on Twitter with the president where he's uh, uh, demonizing social media and trying to appeal to his base. I imagine just for a thought experiment, if some of these social media companies had decentralized work, if they actually had work uh, employees uh, in the Midwest, in the South, who also were part of creating the 21st century public forum, uh, people would feel much more agency. They'd be much less likely uh, to label these tech uh, folks as elite or other. Uh, and so I think it actually would not just help our economics, it would help some of the national cohesiveness that's missing in this country. Now, the president has you know, issued an executive order on censorship and social media firms, and he is angrier than I think we've seen him in a while at Twitter. Jack Dorsey is attaching tags to uh, tweets that he sees as either big mistruths or as glorifying violence, breaking rules that Twitter has set up. Previously, Twitter had uh, uh, decided not to t take any more paid political ads uh, on its site. Facebook, which you also know well, is on the other side of that. Facebook is taking lots of political ads and saying it's not going to be the arbiter of speech. Where's the right point between those two? Well, the, look, the president's just engaged in political theater. He knows, he wants this fight. I mean, it, uh, he, he operates on the premise that all conflict is, is good, and uh, the courts aren't going to uphold his executive order. He knows that, but he's just engaged in rhetoric. Here's what I think we need. I think we need a fairness doctrine for the 21st century. Let me explain how that would work. Let's say the president is tweeting out about conspiracy theories about Joe Scarborough. Well, why not allow the widower who is at issue, who doesn't want the president tweeting about his uh, deceased wife, why not give him the opportunity to send a response, and that response Twitter should send to uh, every person who clicks on the president's tweet? Or why not allow someone to respond uh, to the president's claims about uh, vote ballot fraud. So what I would say is uh, you defeat speech with speech, uh, but you shouldn't give one person a huge megaphone and not allow uh, a fair response. And that was what the fairness doctrine that Reagan uh, got rid of uh, was all about. And we need something similar in a social media age. Where are you on the issue of mail by ballot? I mean, this is the other, you know, you're, you're in California right now, I think. But here in Washington, you know, there's all this stuff brewing. Uh, even the president's spokesperson has voted by mail uh, 10 out of the, the last 11 elections. Uh, the president has himself. And but it's it's we see these assertions that the process would be uh, endemically um, corrupt and 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 rigged. Um, where are you on this, and how likely is it that we're going to see most states adopt by a mail-by-ballot system? And what does the federal government need to do to make that happen? Well, I'm for it. Uh, this is actually a very simple debate. If you want more people to vote or you want less people to vote, and let's just be blunt. Uh, the Republicans believe the less people that vote, the better their chances. Democrats believe that the more people that vote, the better our chances. But the uh, philosophical issue is that more people should vote. And if you believe more people should vote, uh, we ought to have mail-in ballots. The uh, idea that there's some fraud in that is, is absurd. And there's not a single study that shows that vote by mail is subject to more fraud uh, than voting in person. Uh, and that's such a minuscule number in, in either case. So uh, California has shown that it can work. It, it, it's uh, been empowering and uh, for many people. And we ought to be doing that at the national level. And uh, the HEROES Act we passed provides the resources for states to do that. You know, Ro, one of the, you and I have talked a lot about technology and its impact on society and how it can be, uh, you know, essentially something that extends human aspiration as, uh, you know, in, in co contrast to dislodging human aspiration, if you will. And I, and I guess the question I have at the moment, and you're just such a thoughtful guy, is what does our social contract need to be after this period we're in? What does it need to look like? How can we look back to the time of FDR uh, and see things like the WPA or the Tennessee Valley Authority or the CCC? Are there big projects that we need to have people put on uh, the dock that could be you know, part of a new infrastructure that brings this country out of this? Or are we too early for that right now? 
Well, I think a social contract should be that everyone in this country uh, should have the chance that I did. America, if, you, if this country could give the son of immigrants a chance to have a good public education, uh, to have uh, a parents employed with a job that provided health care, uh, to not to live in a safe neighborhood, if, they, if this country could do that for the son of immigrants, why can't the country do this for every American? Uh, and so our social safety net should say, uh, we believe that you should have the freedom to succeed or fail. But before you get to, to do that, you ought to have health care. You ought to have a good education. You ought to have uh, an early childhood education. I mean, Heckman, the Nobel laureate, showed that by the age of five, so much of our uh, life chances are determined based on our upbringing. Uh, and we have to make those basic in investments. And then we ought to be making the investments in the infrastructure for the 21st century. Uh, just like electricity was a necessity, the Internet is a necessity. Basic digital skills are a necessity. And people don't want to just be taken care of. They want to participate in the new economy, and we have to provide those opportunities. So uh, I think that the roadmap of what we need is pretty clear. The question is, will we have the political will? Well, with that, we'll leave it there. I want to thank Congressman Ro Khanna for joining us today on the Hills Coronavirus Report. And I want to thank all of you for joining me. I'm Steve Clemens. We'll see you next week. Be well.